feet in honor of the word of the God. The scripture this week is taken from Mark chapter 14, verse 32 to 52. On the count of three, I'd like you to read with me. One, two, three. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took him with Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could do not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer has given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against as a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Church, this is the word of God. Thank you, Jeremy. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to listen to your word. Open our ears, open our eyes to see the beauty of your words and also to see you and your perfect sacrifice for us. Lord, fill me with your grace so that I can preach boldly and faithfully. And let everything that I say is not my word, but your word. I surrender everything into your name. In the name of Jesus, we say, Amen. Can be seated. So we're going to continue from the book of Mark. So let me start with the story. Twenty years ago, when JJ celebrated 17 years, sweet 17 years, uh, so I cannot tell his age, but 20 years ago when we are 17. So basically at that time, our life is only divided by two moments, a bad moment and a good moment. It's only two. Bad moment is when you get a bad grade, bad moment when you're rejected by your girl, a good moment when you get a good gift, only those two moments. But right now, you know what? We're living in the world. There's this extra layer on the top. So bad moment, good moment, and Instagram moment. <laughs> Do you agree that? Do we have to admit that's not all good moment is considered as Instagram moment. Only uh, something that has the wow moment that can be considered as the Instagram moment. And that wow moment is the one that we fit to our mind every day. Do you agree? When you open your Instagram, strolling your Instagram, sometimes it's feeding to your mind, this is the life should be. And what happens is, when something hits you, problem hits you, and you ask, what was this? I thought this kind of like not the life should be. The life should be, it should be like in the Instagram. 
That's all good wow moment over there. My friend is going to holiday, no problem during the parenting. The kids is behave nicely. And what happened right now? Why only me that have to go through all this problem? And then, then we ask why. We question God, and then we kind of tempted. We are tempted to not going to church. We are tempted to not going to MC anymore. We stop praying. We hate God. And then we run away from Jesus. You know what? We as a Christian, when we hit with the big problems, sometimes we always going like we fall into this two extreme. All right. the, our response when we hit by a big problem, the first extreme is basically this first group is basically that when it hit by a big problem, it's basically that he's, you know what? The Bible says we have to rejoice all the time. So this first group is always in denial. Even they are on the bottom of the valley. How are you? Oh, God is good all the time. All right. Every time I go to MC, how, how's your life? Oh, my life is always good, but the inside is struggling. This first group is always in denial. It's true, the Bible said we have to be rejoiced in our suffering. But in the same time, the Bible also said that in the process that you will rejoice in your suffering, God allow us to grieve. God allow us to lament. But if you not be careful with the grief, we're going to fall into another extreme. We hit by the problem. And what happened is we just stuck in the bubble of grief. We don't go anywhere. We don't do anything. We just stuck in the bubble of grief. We feel self-pity. We feel useless. And what happened during that time? The temptation come. It's whispered on your ear. Where is your God? Where is your God? I thought he's a loving God. I think you are not loved by him anymore. Run away from him. Run away from him. And we end up, we found ourselves, we avoiding church. We avoiding cell group. We don't want to pray anymore. And that's what we're going to learn today from this pericop, the Gethsemane. We're going to learn from Jesus himself. He faced one of the biggest temptations of his life, run away from the cross. We learn how he respond from that temptation. And that's what we're going to learn today. So I'm going to divide my sermon into three parts, the agony, the temptations, and the rejection. Let's start, the agony. When I was a kid, five years, four years old, I had a good friend. And his parents, basically, both of them is a doctor. I don't know whether in here that you have both of your parents is a doctor. No? Okay. So this, my good friend, is both of the parents is a doctor. He's a doctor, and one day, he didn't come to school for one week. For one week, he didn't come to school, and straight away, I'm thinking that, ah, this, uh, my friend, is going for holiday overseas. One week is quite a long time, one week, right? So when he come back, uh, after one week, he said, hey, where do you go? Do you go for holiday? And he was surprised. What do you mean? I was sick. I was on the hospital for one week. I said, hey, really? But both of your parents is a doctor. So at that time, I have that kind of a concept that if your parent is a doctor, especially both of them, you cannot be sick. <laughs> and I just I was surprised. And he was shocked. And they said, no, even my parents, both of them is a doctor. I can be sick as well. The same thing, you know, we as Christians, sometimes we have that concept. We see Jesus just as a fully God. But we forget he also a fully man. The many times that we only see God as a, Jesus as a fully God, which is true. But don't forget, he's a fully man as well. As the Christians, it's important for us to understand this teaching about the humanity of Christ. He's not only fully God, but he's also a fully man. Because if we don't understand, we don't grasp that Jesus is fully man as well, you know what? We're going to be disconnected with our Savior. When we're, going to the say, when we're going to the suffering, we're going to ask, God, you are, you are just God. You don't know what I feel. You don't understand what I feel. You are God over there. But we have to remember, he's not just a fully God. 
is a fully man. You know what? Throughout the Bible, we can see some brief example of the humanity of Jesus Christ. He is tired. He is hungry. He is thirsty like us. He shows some emotion. The shortest verses of the Bible, he wept. He show all those emotion, but nowhere else in the Bible we can see the humanity of Christ other than in this passage in the Gethsemane, and that's what we're gonna learn today. And let's have a look, verse 33 and verse 34. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Here Jesus faced one of his biggest problems. He felt the weight of his rescue mission. He felt all the weight right now. He said that to the disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. In other words, Jesus said, you know what? This situation right now is really killing me. It's really killing me. It's coming from Jesus. He knows what's going to happen. But really that is getting closer to that hour is now become, become a weight to him. That is become like, it's very sorrowful for me. This situation is killing me. He's so distressed. He's so troubled to the point when he prayed, he fell on the ground. We found in another pericope that when Jesus prayed, he kneeling down, he looked up to the heaven, he's standing up, but at this point in here, he fell on the ground. That's how far he felt the burden of this rescue mission. What was the cause of his sorrow? I mean, because that if I, when I read this one, that Jesus, before this pericope, it's very clear that you predicted your death. Three times, not once, not twice, three times. And he did it very calm. He did it very And right now at this point, that he f didn't calm at all. He was greatly dis distressed. Why? Again, because he's a fully man. Same as us, when we hit by all those situations, we feel like that. And Jesus also do the same. He can feel like us. But in the same, t in the same time as well, that like he's a fully man and he's a fully God. What it means? He knows exactly what's going to happen to him. Exactly to the detail what's going to happen to him in the next 24 hours. He will be beaten badly. He will be mocked. People gonna spit on him. He will be whipped on his back really bad. He will be forced to carry a very heavy cross. He will be nailed to the cross and lifted high so the people can see him. He saw all those physical suffering that gonna happen to him in the next 24 hours. He saw all this physical suffering is getting closer. But those physical suffering is nothing compared to what can he has to endure after that. Those physical pain are bad, but it's nothing compared to the spiritual pain that he will go through at the cross. At the cross, for the first time, he's going to be exposed to the one thing that really, he really hates the most is a sin. For the first time, He's going to be exposed to the sin. He's going to take all our sins. And he knows what's going to happen. He knows what it means. It means that God, his Father, is going to pour the wrath on him. And he knows what it means. It means that he's going to be separated from his Father. And it caused Jesus to say, that, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in this garden, in this 
Gethsemane that this thought and the anticipation of Jesus, what's going to happen to him for the next 20 hour, 24 hours, make him fall, feel so distressed and troubled. Tim Keller said that in the Gethsemane, Jesus began to experience the spiritual, cosmic, infinite disintegrations that would happen when he becomes separated from his father on the cross. Jesus began to experience merely a foretaste of that, and he staggered. It's really important for us to really understand about Jesus is not only fully man, is also he also fully God. He's a f he's, he's not just a fully God, but he's also fully man. Because if we miss that one, otherwise we're gonna keep asking this question: God, I'm going through all this suffering. I don't I don't think that you know what I'm going through. But the humanity of Jesus Christ is a good news for us because Jesus know your feeling. Jesus know your cry. Jesus know your worry. The humanity of Christ is good news for us. Otherwise, we're going to keep asking the, this question, I'm going through the worst situation, God. I don't think you know what I feel. But really, what we are going through is nothing compared to what Jesus went through. Same as us. Same as us, when we are hit by all those things, he can feel all the worry and everything. And same as us as well, when we are facing a big problem that we are tempted. We are tempted to run away from Jesus. And it leads me to my second point, the temptation. So in here in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus faced the biggest temptation which is he was tempted to run away from the cross. I hope every Christian in here realize that we as Christians, we are not immune to all the temptation. We are not immune to all the suffering. We are tempted almost every day. All right? We are tempted almost every day. But there's one common misunderstanding that uh, sometimes that people ask me. Whether being tempted is a sin or not. Being tempted is not a sin. But when you give in to the temptation, that's a sin. Because Jesus is being tempted as well. But the difference is Jesus didn't give in to the temptation. Jesus didn't give in to temptation, but us. There's many of us sometimes, including me. Sometimes we are too easily, we don't fight or anything, we give in to the temptation. We give in too easily to the temptation. And that's what we're going to learn from Jesus right now. How Jesus respond when he faced the temptation. So let's have a look first 36. So basically that Jesus pray and this is what he say. Abba Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus started with, with the prayer that calling his father, Abba Father. All things are possible for you. It's not a common thing at that time to, during the prayer, you call God Abba Father. But Jesus called God Abba Father because he has a personal relationship with his Father. And for us, it's one important thing when we pray. We must know to whom we pray. We pray to our Heavenly Father. Yes, amen. We know about that. But sometimes that we don't realize that. Sometimes we have a thought that when we pray to God, we pray to God whom other religions also pray to. This is what we call universal God. We don't pray to the universal God. We pray to our Heavenly Father. It's a very personal. He loves His children. And that's why the many times that we kind of underestimate the privilege to be a God's children. We are God children, but we say, yeah, it's God children. Yes, yeah, sometimes we underestimate to be a God children. Why? Because we're thinking that the God that we pray to is the God for all people. It's the universal God that all religion also pray to. No, He is our Heavenly Father. And the Bible is very clear. 
that the God that we we worship is not the God for all people, only those people who receive Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. We can be a God children, it's not because we are we are good, because of not because of our strength, but because of the union in Christ that we adopted. We are in Christ and Christ in us. And that's the reason we can come in our in the midst of our temptation, we can confidently come to our Abba Father in our prayer. He's a perfect Father who makes no mistake. And then Jesus continued his prayer. Remove this cup from me. I mean, I love about this. Remove this cup from me. I love just how Jesus showing his true feeling. We have to imagine that at this time, Jesus is so burdened, but he has to go through all the suffering, all the agony. And Jesus in here, that Jesus is just showing his true feeling. God, remove this cup from me. He didn't hide anything. He didn't really kind of quote it with some of the fancy word or anything. God, remove this cup from me. How many times we as Christians, when we come to God, when we pray, we try to hide our true feeling. We try to quote it with all a good words or anything. But in here that we can learn from Jesus, Jesus just come to God, God, this cup really make me tired. Remove this cup from me. And that's God, that's what God wants from us when we in the bottom of the valley come as you are. Don't need to hide anything. So Jesus said, remove this cup from me. So what is the cup? The cup in here is the cup of the wrath of God. And that's why Jesus is really afraid of that, afraid of that cup. Because he know that when God the Father pour his wrath, he separated from his Father. And the question is, Jesus tempted to run away from the cross. Is it possible for Jesus to run away from the cup? Is it possible for Jesus to run away from the cross? I think if he wants, he can. He's been living a perfect life. He's been living the perfect life. But at the same time, Jesus knew it is impossible for him to avoid the cup, but in the same time, he accomplished the redemption. It's impossible for him to avoid the cross, but in the same time, he accomplished the redemption. Jesus knew that to save us from the eternal condemnations, he has to take the cup. Jesus knew that there's no other way to save us. Jesus asked God for a different way, but he knew the second option wasn't God's will. And he surrendered his will into God's will, and he ended his prayer. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. I love that it's not captured in the book of Mark, but in the book of Luke, as soon as Jesus surrendered his will to God's will, in the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 43, it said that, there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. As Jesus obeyed and submitted his will to God's will, the Father strengthened him. Same as today. God may, take, may not take away the cup or the suffering from your life. But you know what? He will provide whatever you need to go through that suffering. He will give the strength that we need. He will give the comfort that we need. God may let you go through the suffering for a bigger purpose. What a bigger purpose? He wants you to experience. He wants to see His presence in your life. He wants you to see His comfort in your life. He wants you to see His love in the midst of the suffering. And that's really the purpose of a prayer. And I love how R.C. Pro put it. Does prayer change God's mind? No. Your prayer doesn't change God. Does prayer change the things? 
Yes, of course. What prayer most often changes is the wickedness and the hardness of our own heart. And that's the purpose of our prayer. We aligning our will with God's will. So that Jesus faced the biggest temptations and then he didn't give in. On the other hand, his disciple also faced the temptation but did the opposite way. Let's read verse 37 and 40. And he came and found the disciples sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same word. And again he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy, and they didn't know what to answer him. Somehow this is the message for some of the people that come back from the camp. <laughs> Your eyes were very heavy. No, just kidding. Uh, where are we? Yeah. <laughs> so basically that not only Jesus faced the temptations, but the disciples faced the temptation as well. And even Jesus gave the warning to them, watch and pray that you may not enter into the temptation. And this is really the warning from Jesus. That basically Jesus is saying that, you know what, disciples, prepare yourself because you're going to see the terrible thing happen to me. You're going to see your personal Savior going to be captured. You're going to see your personal Savior is going to be mocked, is going to be tortured, and going to be crucified. And the devil is going to whisper on your ear, run away from your Savior. He's not good enough. Basically, Jesus gives the warning to them, prepare yourself. And as we know in the next verses, Jesus found them sleeping. You know what? This disciple is not like people that are really far from Jesus. He saw all the miracles that Jesus did. Raised people from the dead. Even these people, most of them say that, Jesus, I promise you I will not leave you. I'm going to be stay with you. It's just a couple of verse, if you flip back, they promise to Jesus that I will not leave you. But they cannot even open their eyes for one hour for Jesus. So in this garden, Jesus faced the temptations. The disciples faced the temptations. The disciples faced the temptation to run away from Jesus. Jesus faced the temptation to run away from the cross. Basically, this is the last chance of Jesus. If he wants to run away, this is the last chance. But he stayed put. Because, you know what, if you, do you know, right? If, if Jesus gives in to the temptations, all of us will be no hope. We'll be going to hell. Instead, Jesus did all the wrestling. Jesus did all the struggling. Through all the agony. When the disciple cannot stay awake for one hour for Jesus, Jesus used every single minute to prepare himself so that he didn't give in to, to the temptation. Disciple cannot stay awake for one hour. Jesus used every single minute to prepare himself so that he didn't give in to the temptation to run away from the cross. Isn't it good news for us? He did that for us. So it means that the sacrifice from Jesus should give us hope when we're facing a temptation. This should give us the courage to fight the temptation and win. And I just love how Jesus connects the prayer with the temptation in here. Because many times we, we always relate prayer when we need something. Oh, I need something. Let's pray. Nothing wrong with that. But I just love in here that Jesus reminds us, you know what? You can come to God. You can come to your Savior in the midst of your temptation. He teaches us to pray in the midst of our temptations. God wants us to come to Him 
So our prayer it might be just as simple like, Heavenly Father, I'm so tempted right now to click this website with I shouldn't. Help me. Your prayer could be just, Heavenly Father, my heart is so envious right now. I'm so jealous right now. Please help me. Please help me. We also learn from Jesus that come to Him with your true feeling. Don't need to hide anything. Because God knows your true feeling. You don't need to quote it with all the fancy words. Or you don't need to wait until you get the good news and come to Jesus with the positive feeling or anything. You don't need to wait until that. In the bottom of your feeling, you can come to God as you are. Your prayer can be just simple like, Heavenly Father, I know that you are a good God. But let me be honest that at this moment, I don't feel that way. But I want to trust you. I want to trust you. You can share your true feeling. Because you pray to God that He is the Heavenly Father, that He loves His children. And lead me to the last point, the rejection. Let's jump a little bit to the last verses of this paragraph, verse 51 and 52. This is the one that I think just stay waiting for this uh, verse. Let me read it. And the young man follow him, verse 51 and 52. And a young man follow him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Just a bit of a funny story to start. So when Pastor Yosia gives a pericope to us, to Josh, to me, he's a, he's a very specific guy. Yeah? As you know that our Bill of Pastors is very specific. He gives this verse into this verse, including this, the last two verses, right? And I'm thinking, why did he give me these two verses, right? The, the young man ran away naked. Uh, so what I did in my manuscript, I pretend those verses is not there, right? <laughs> so I just stop in the first 50, and I submit to my manuscript and saying that I hope my bill of pastor didn't pick it up and say good manuscript, and come back that oh, that's it. But as you know, pastor sometimes have that sense, right? And then he said that ah, uh, let me just read it what he say, right? Uh, he said that. Don't forget the first about the, the young man running, running naked. It's a part of your text. This one that really hit me the last sentence. You cannot pretend it's not there. He can read my mind. <laughs> he can read my mind. Oh, can't believe it. Can't believe it. But, <laughs> all right, going back to these two, this two uh, the young men run, uh, run naked. But, but one thing that we can learn from here. One thing that we can learn from here, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to really like uh, speculate because some commentary is saying that this young man is basically Mark himself. But there's no like a strong evidence. Let's not, let's not speculate about that one. Let's don't focus on the, his identity. But I just want to use these two verses to put you in the scenes what happening at that time. How terrifying the situation at that time. This young man faced the scary situation. This is scary to the point that he prefer to run away naked rather than be arrested with Jesus. That's how terrifying the situation. He prefers to lose his identity by run naked rather than be arrested with Jesus. And that's how terrifying the situation at that time. And that might happen to disciples as well. The disciple is the people that are saying, that, I'm going to be with you, Jesus. But when he faced all those situations, they're the one that the first one ran away from Jesus. I don't know, at this point, I hope you can feel how lonely Jesus is going through all these situations. For me, one of the worst things when we face trouble, when we go into the suffering, the worst things is we, if we have to go through all those, those suffering 
alone. There's no one support us. There's no one understand us. It doesn't matter how big, how small. If you have to go through that suffering by yourself, for me that's the worst thing. But again, that's what happened to Jesus. That's what happened to Jesus. In verse 41, Jesus asked the disciples to stay awake and keep watch with Jesus. And for the third time, Jesus found them sleeping. And in the first 50, at the end of verse 50, he said that they all, all of them, left him and fled. In the Gethsemane, Jesus has to endure the most agony. All the pain. He can feel all the physical and spiritual suffering. Because he can see what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. He can see the wrath of his father. He can see the sins that are going to be in touch with his pure body. But Jesus went through all those things alone. He prayed alone in the garden. He suffered alone at the cross. He going through all the suffering by himself. He prayed alone. Everyone left him. He going to the cross by himself. But listen, church. Jesus willing to suffer alone at the cross for his people. So that his people right now don't need to suffer alone. He willing to give everything to suffer alone, to endure the most agony, so that right now we don't need to suffer alone because we have Jesus on our side. He's not just Jesus that is fully God. He's a Jesus that fully man. That understand your cry, understand your worry, understand your anxious and his promise for all of us that he gonna be with us until the end of the age how good is that the person that know everything about our feeling is gonna be with us in our in the midst of our suffering it's very easy when we're going through this pericle it's very easy to, for us to really saying that I won't be like a disciple. I won't be like them. I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm going to church every single week. I always never miss the MC. I will, I will not be like a disciple. It's very easy for us to come out with that mind. But let me tell you, you're not learning from the disciple. And that's what disciple did. He relying on, his, on their strength. And that's a very shaky foundation. They give in to the temptation. They run away from Jesus. You know what? We're living in the era maybe we not face exactly the same temptation like the disciple. But we are tempted every single day to run away from Jesus. We are tempted to pursue money and forget about Jesus. We are tempted to pursue our job and run away from Jesus. We are, we are tempted to pursue our comfort and forget about Jesus. We are, pursued to, to, we are tempted to pursue position, power, and forget about Jesus. We are same as those disciples. But I want to close with this. The key to fight the temptation is not relying on your strength. If you're relying on your strength, trust me, it's just a matter of time you're going to be like the disciple. When facing the terrifying situation, you are maybe the first one going to run away from Jesus. The key to fight the temptations is you, if you can really experience, if you can really grasp that Jesus is someone that loves you so much that he's willing to die on the cross. They're willing to going through all the agony by himself. 
that love. So the key to fight the temptation is not your strength, but realizing there is someone who is better than those temp temptations. If you see Jesus as your treasure, if you can see Jesus better than your temptation, that's really the key to fight the temptation. Church, if we can grasp what happening to Jesus in this garden, I hope you can see how much Jesus loves you. He's willing to go through all that far for you and me. If we can experience, if we can taste that amazing love, our heart can only sing out that, God, you are so amazing. Amazing, your amazing love. How can it be that you, my king, should die for me? How can it be you are my savior have to go through like that? How can it be? If not, about, if not because of amazing love. He is our savior. And this is a question for some of you that maybe you haven't put your faith in, your, in Jesus as your personal savior. This is really the invitation that if you really let the gospel speak to you, don't wait. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, that for your, for your presence in the midst of us. Just want to pray, help us open our heart to see your amazing love. Help us to always look at you in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our suffering, and even when in the midst of our temptations. That you are here with us. Remind us that we never, ever, we never, ever be alone. Because our Savior, they know us so much, they love us so much, gonna be with us till the end of the age. My prayer that lets everyone in here can experience your love, your grace, to the point that the, that the only thing that can come up to, from our heart is just a praise, that amazing love, that how can it be my King, my Savior should die for me. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.